Welcome to me. Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you will connect with God and build community with Christ followers. Please use the online form to let us know how we can pray for you this week. If you are worshiping in person, you can fill out a connection card located at the back. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates or if you're having trouble receiving our emails, please contact the church office. Sermon questions for small group or personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. If you are new here, we'd like to invite you to our next Discover MACC dinner. Together we will enjoy a meal and a short discussion about who we are at Maple Avenue Christian Church. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MACC. Today, we will also host a reception for Jason Sunkelke as he moves into the role of Creative Media and Communications Minister. Bring a side dish to share. We have the rest covered. The Kramers will perform here at MACC June 12th at 5 p.m. This is a free concert at which a love offering will be taken. We would like to invite you to our Sunday evening worship service where we will be singing songs of praise and worship. Hey, hun, could you go get me some hymns? Uh, sure. Here you go. What is that? Well, they're hymn clothes. We had them in a Christmas play last year. No, I would. They're old. You sing with them. I think they might be in the back. Oh, okay. Here you go, babe. What are you doing with Mr. G? Well, he sings. He's old. And he is a him. Oh, just forget it. Hymns. A hymnal. Oh. Come join us on Sunday evenings this summer for praise, worship, and a short devotional. Hope to see you there. Well, I can still come, can't I? Well, of course you can, Very Mr. G. I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> there will be no youth group tonight. Dates to remember. Retirement reception for Steve Clements will be Sunday, June 26th at 1.33 sharp. We will also welcome our new children's minister, Amy Morris, with a reception July 3rd at 12.30. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, you can't say we didn't tell you. Will you please stand this morning? I'm going to start us off with a scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14 says, Remember at that time, because you were Gentiles, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, Christ in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have the wonderful privilege to be in relationship with Christ because of his righteousness and sacrifice. So let's praise him for what he has done together.
Father, we are so thankful that you have brought us near. Because of the blood of Jesus, we can approach you. We can have a relationship, a personal relationship with you. Lord, you sent your son Jesus to die so that we can have life. Lord, our life is yours. We just give it up to you this morning because you are deserving. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name.
If the Onis and uh, Akinyamis would come forward, please, and just come join me on stage. Uh, this is a time in our service, a, a time of the year that we get to do something we call our child dedication. Now, this is not that the small children here are, are dedicating themselves to doing anything. This is us as a church family and these families together dedicating ourselves to raising these children to know and love Jesus. So we have here uh, Amatola and uh, her husband Olana Raju is in D.C. right now. Okay, but they're here with E-Ray. E-Ray, you want to say hi to everybody? <laughs> and then we have the Akinyemis and... Uh, Alua Sagun and Ire de Sola Akinyemi and Ola. <laughs> Ola, you want to say hi to everybody? No, you're doing good. You got your little thing there, right? <laughs> All right. Now we're going to go over a few Bible verses together, and then we're going to make statements of dedication based on those. The first two are for the parents, and the second two are for us as the church. Uh, Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Parents, as we celebrate today, the first thing that we must do is recognize that your child is a blessing from God. Simply holding this child is a grace that we do not deserve, but God takes great joy in it. Your child is evidence of God's goodness. If you believe this to be so, please say, we are blessed. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, impress them, that being God's laws, on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Parents, the Bible makes clear that this blessing comes with a great responsibility. As parents, you are called to teach your child to love and obey God. As God gives you the strength to do so, you are to take every opportunity to lead your child to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you accept this calling, please say, we are committed. We are committed. All right, church, it's your turn. 
Matthew 18, 6 says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be thrown into the depths of the sea. Church, Jesus makes clear that we share this responsibility with the parents. Every word and deed these children witness from us will either support or contradict the truth of the gospel. Just as these parents are called to model Christ in their homes, we are called to model Christ as the family of God. If you recognize this responsibility, church, please say, we are family. We are family. Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says, Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Church, we are called to be a community of support to these parents, as well as a source of accountability. When one of these parents falls short in their duty to portray Christ to their child, we're commanded to bring support and correction in love. And we are equally commanded to encourage them and celebrate their successes. If you are ready to help them along, please say, we are here for you. Congratulations. Thank you. As As we continue worshiping this morning, please take a moment and greet those around you. Welcome to Maple Avenue, everybody. Uh, we are glad that you're here to worship with us this morning, uh, whether you're joining us for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, or maybe you're here every week. We're just glad that you're here, and we're here to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in this place today. Um, just a reminder, uh, do stick around for that potluck after uh, our service today to uh, spend some time with Jason as he transitions uh, from children's ministry to creative media and communications. I want to encourage him as he makes that move and uh, <clears throat> just encourage the fellowship of believers being together. So I want to invite you to bring to do that. Even if you're, you're visiting or you didn't know anything about this today, still stay. There's going to be plenty of food for everybody, so make sure you hang out with us this afternoon. 
Um, this morning, we're going to continue on in this series that we've been in, in the book of 1 Peter. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and start making your way to 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. This is a touchy subject that we're going to talk about this morning, and I just want to acknowledge that right up front. But uh, I've been praying and asking the Holy Spirit to lead me in how we cover this topic today, and so uh, I feel confident that the Holy Spirit's going to lead us in our worship and is leading us in our worship this morning. Um, but this letter that Peter is writing, it's to his Jewish friends who are scattered all over, okay? And they're encountering all kinds of persecution, lots of hard times, lots of hard trials that they're going through. And so he's writing this as a letter of encouragement so that these folks who are going through all this persecution can truly have hope-filled lives, which is something that I'm sure all of us would want more of, just more hope in our lives. And that's what Peter's writing this letter about. And we've been saying through this series that if you want that hope-filled living, then you have to stand fast in the true grace of God. And I believe that so much. In our passage today, what it's going to do is it's going to show us how we can stand fast in the true grace of God. And it's going to teach us how to stand fast in the true grace of God by learning to live in submission with other people. So that's what we're going to talk about. Great topic. Submission, something we all love to do, right? Submit to others. Probably not. But anyway, would you guys stand with me? I'm going to pray as we get ready to read God's Word and, and talk about it this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together to worship you. And Father, we now worship you through the reading of your Word, through the preaching of your Word. Pray that we uh, just exhort one another and that we uh, just praise you through that, that we bring glory and honor to your holy name. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please stand, if you would, or keep standing as we read God's word this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Peter writes this. He says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it, is, uh, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You can have a seat. Thank you. So like I said, kind of a touchy topic that we're going to talk about this morning. Last week in chapter 2 verses 11 through 17, we talked about how we're to live in obedience to God and God's authority over our lives. And so our passage today and our passage next week, so when you come back next week, this is what we talk, well, we'll be dealing with, living in submission to each other. And now, listen, unless we submit to Jesus Christ, we're really going to struggle with this week and next week. So the first thing that each one of us has to do is we have to submit ourselves to Christ. That's really what we have to do. Otherwise, all that we're going to talk about today, really, we're going to lose it. Okay? So no matter what the situation is, we are to respond with a submissive attitude. And that's hard for folks to accept. See, the way we described submission last week, we said that it is to rank yourself under, to arrange yourself under someone else. And so the whole idea is to put yourself under someone else's uh, authority in order to build them up, to lift them up. That's the whole idea. So before we dive into our passage this morning, to, to understand the culture that Peter's writing to, especially as it relates to slavery, okay? We need to understand that. So what's he talking about? Because I'm sure I can guess where most of our minds went when we heard that word slavery. And I just want to kind of guide us through that. Slavery was very, very common in the Roman Empire. 
made up about a third of the entire population. About a third of the people were slaves in the Roman Empire. There were four main types of slaves that occurred. There were those who worked in mines, those who worked on farms, those who were in the cities, and those who were in homes. Okay? Peter, in this passage, okay, he's referring to household slaves in our passage. Okay? But the actual Greek word that's used here is not the word for slave. Okay? The actual Greek word, and I don't know why the NIV translated it as slave because that's not the word. The actual Greek word is oikates. Oikates. And oikates means servant. That's what it means. And it specifically is talking about a household servant, which relates exactly to what we were talking about, that the Romans had all those kinds. So here's the definition according to Strong's lexicon, okay? One who lives in the same house as another, spoken of all who are under the authority of one in the same householder. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. There is actually a different word altogether in the Greek language for the word slave, in the way we're probably thinking. And that's the Greek word doulos. Doulos is the word for slave. Now, this is a person who gives himself up to another person's will, okay? This word, or even idea, that the Apostle Paul is using is not in any way related to the idea of what most of us thought about back in the 16, 17, 1800s, okay? It's not that idea. The horrible degradation of slaves in our country was wrong, flat out wrong. There is no two ways about it. And I will go on to say this, any kind of racism in our hearts and in our churches and in our community and in our country is wrong. It's just 100% wrong. There is nothing godly or Christian about it. Unfortunately, we cannot legislate racism. We cannot legislate it. And you know why? Because it's a heart issue. It begins here. Deep down in this dark place that nobody knows except you and God, that's where it begins. Racism is a hard issue long before it's ever demonstrated in actions. And racism comes in all sizes and shapes and colors. Servants, however, in the Roman Empire were generally well treated. Some were even managers and trained professionals. Or well, they had professions like doctors and lawyers. They were normally paid for their services, and they had protection under Roman law. Servants were usually financially uh, oppressed and needed help. So what they would do is they would bond themselves to a household, and they would serve the household in exchange for shelter and food and clothing and representation and even protection. They needed the protection of the household. Now, this all got its start back in the Old Testament, all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15, okay? Now, back in Deuteronomy chapter 15, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, this is Moses retelling the law, okay, the Pentateuch. He's retelling all of that, and Joshua, I believe, is writing it all down. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 15, there's a passage in there that talks about whenever a person comes to a homeowner and says, hey, I want to give myself, uh, enslave myself to you for the rest of my life for your protection, for your help, for your aid, for all the things that you can provide for me, then they would perform this ceremony that they would do. And the ceremony was this. The, the person who was submitting themselves to the owner would take their earlobe and put it on the doorpost and they would drive an awl through it, okay? Now, why would they do that? Well, I believe the greatest reason that they did that is so in the 20th and 21st century, Christians could get their ears pierced and people not lose their mind about it. I'm just kidding. That's not really why they did it. They did it, to, they did it on the earlobe as a symbol of the servant's willingness to listen and to obey what the master said. That's why they did it there. Because if we don't listen, 
then we're not going to know how to obey or what to obey. That's a great message for us today. Listen to God, our master, as we live in submission to others. Listen to God, our master, as we live in submission to others. Christianity introduced a a new relationship of brotherhood and dignity for every person that eventually led to societal transformation. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28. He wrote this. He said, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. I believe the best place for us living in the 21st century United States uh, to understand this is in our working relationships. I believe that's how it best relates to us, is in how we uh, work with others. Now, some of you, I know, are in a, in a really tough work environment right now. Some of you are working incredible amounts of overtime. Some of you, there are shortages of, of staff, and, and you're maybe working two or three jobs at the same place with little thanks. Uh, you know, there's just tough things. And so I don't want to minimize or trivialize that you may feel trapped to uh, the job that you're in. You may actually even hate the job that you're doing. You may feel like they're taking advantage of you. I pray that you'll come away today with a godly game plan for how to move forward in your job tomorrow. Okay? That's what I hope. And so the first thing that I think we have to do in our work is we have to imitate Christ. Imitate Christ in your work. When you go to work in the morning, imitate Christ in your work. Employers. You need to be careful not to treat people like property. Not to treat them as a punch card, as a timesheet. And employees, you need to be faithful to those who are over you. Not cheating them by not doing your work. By filling your time with distractions while you're on the clock. You need to be faithful. You must exhibit Christ-like qualities, both the employer and employee, if you're a Christ follower. That's one of the first things we need to do. Christians should not only be the best citizens, but also the best employees and employers. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So no matter what you do, do it as though you're doing it for the Lord. Let's look at how to live out this first exhortation, okay? First, we have to respect, you have to have respect toward your boss, okay? And likewise, employers, bosses, you have to have respect toward your employees. I remember something that uh, Steve Swedell's dad, Lenny Swedell, used to say all the time. I used to work with him on Fridays out on the farm, and Lenny would always say this. He'd say, the boss may not always be right, but the boss is always the boss. Well, see, Lenny was the boss, and I was like, yes, sir, you're right, (laughs) whatever. But that's true, and we've lost that in our day and age. You still need to be respectful. Even if you don't agree, be respectful. We're called to serve with a submissive heart in verse 18. This means to have a healthy desire to avoid their displeasure. To, to show uh, deference or, or reverence, okay? This is not easy to do, and I'm not trying to pretend it is. Some of us conform on the outside as we grumble on the inside. Anybody ever done that? You can raise your hand. That's not that embarrassing because most of us should raise our hand because we grumble on the outside. There's some holier than thou's here not raising their hands, but that's okay because most of us grumble on the outside, uh, on the inside while we conform on the outside. And that reminds me of an old story by one of my favorite preachers, Adrian Rogers. I really love that guy. He used to tell this story. He said, a father told his four-year-old son to sit down, but the son didn't sit down. So the father said a second time, son, I said, sit down. Well, the boy still didn't sit down. Finally, the father walked over and he grabbed him by his shoulders and he put him forcefully into the chair. And he said, now, son, sit there. And the little boy said, well, daddy, I may be sitting down on the outside But he added defiantly, I'm standing up on the inside. A lot of us get in that mode. 
A lot of us can act like that. A rebellious spirit is not always discernible except to God and the person who has it. Is there some area in your life where you're standing up on the inside? Is there some area in your life where you're being defiant towards God or rebelling towards others? And what we're talking about today, maybe towards your employer. Or are you being a good, submissive employee? That doesn't mean you're a doormat. That's not what submission means. It doesn't mean you're a doormat for people to wipe their feet on. No. But are you submitting to the authorities that are over you? If on the inside you still harbor a rebellious spirit, you're not really obeying. You're not really obeying. We're called to obey on both the inside and the outside. So I want to encourage you. Think about that. Pray about that. Ask God to give you the power, the strength to submit. Because it does take strength to submit. Submission is not rolling over, playing dead. It takes greater strength to submit than it does to be in defiance. Next, we live out this exhortation faithfully, even if it's not fair. Oh, the reality is life isn't fair. That's the reality. Life's not fair. But we haven't been called to live in a fair life. We've been called to live faithfully as we live life. Does that make sense? Do you think it was fair that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, my sins? Do you think that was fair? He didn't die because of his own sins. He had no sin. He was perfect. No, that's anything but fair. Is injustice fair? Absolutely not. No. But we are to be thankful to the character. Uh, as, as a Christ follower, we are to be thankful. That's the character we're supposed to have. And we'll talk more about this a little bit later. But the word in verse 18, this word harsh, it's the Greek word skolios. No, it's not. It's the Greek word skolios. And this word is where we get our word scoliosis or crooked. That's where it comes from. Listen, life is crooked. That's the reality. People are crooked. We're not always treated fairly. We're not always treated straightforwardly. When you're not treated straightforwardly, that's harsh. That's scolios. But we're to live faithfully no matter how we're treated. C.S. Lewis once wrote, or asked, why, why do the righteous suffer? I mean, we're living righteous lives. Why do we have to suffer? And I love his answer. His answer was, why not? We should be the only ones who can take it. Next, we live out this exhortation when we see God as our ultimate boss. When you get up and go to work in the morning, who do you recognize as your ultimate boss? Just this week, we're training uh, somebody for our buildings and ground. Abby is training for buildings and grounds, and Steve was and I were talking, and he said, Donnie's not your boss, God is. And that's the attitude I want our staff to have. I'm not. I'm the supervisor. I have to do all this other stuff, but God's our boss. God is our boss. When we submit in order to honor God, it's commendable. It's absolutely commendable. This word means approval, favor, or grace. Notice that we're called to endure grief and even to suffer wrongfully. But when we do, we receive God's favor. And so this word favor is, I believe, overused way too much by TV preachers who tend to only focus on health and wealth and happiness. God's favor and approval is extended when we are sick. It's extended when we are suffering. It's extended when we are sad. It's extended when we grieve. That's his favor on us. And maybe even more so when we're going through those difficult times of life. Yes, he's always good to us, just like we sing about. But that doesn't mean life is always easy. Even in the hard times of life, God is good. God is faithful. One of the best ways to stay on track in the workplace is to recognize that ultimately the Almighty is your employer. Howard Hendricks, some of you remember that name, 
Um, I, I really appreciated Howard Hendricks. Howard Hendricks tells the story of being on a plane that was delayed on the ground for takeoff. And the passengers became upset and impatient. And one of the guys became really obnoxious about the whole thing. Started losing his mind about stuff. And he took all his frustrations out on one flight attendant. She held her composure, he said, and smiled courteously. When they finally took off, Howard Hendricks asked the flight attendant to come over. And he said this. He said, ma'am, can I get your name? I want to write a letter of commendation to your employer. And he was surprised when she looked at him and said, well, thank you, sir. But I don't work for American Airlines. I work for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That kind of explains how she could have handled such a negative and obnoxious person who was mistreating her for no reason. The key is to be mindful of who your master really is. So as you go to work tomorrow, go to work for the Lord in word and deed. Do everything as though you're doing it unto him. I just want to encourage you to do that. Next, so we want to imitate Christ in our work. And second, we want to imitate Christ in our attitude. Imitate Christ in your attitude. Look again at verse 21 in your passage, if you would. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you a what? Are you looking? An example, you can say it with confidence it's there for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps now see what we have to remember is Paul writing from a prison cell in Rome the apostle Paul wrote about the attitude a Christian should have in Philippians 1 27 he said whatever happens conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ just let those words soak in for just a minute whatever happens Whatever happens, good or bad, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Is that the way we live? Do we do that? No matter what's going on around us, are we conducting ourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? Now, some of you feel like you're in a prison cell when you go to work. Whether or not you are, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Paul's words are whatever happens. I know this is so much easier said than done. I get that. But the whatever happens here is a reference to whether Paul can come and visit the Philippians or not. Does he have to stay in prison or does he get out? Paul gave this instruction so that whether I come and see you, he says, or only hear about you in my absence... I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. No matter what unexpected disruptions you have, frustrations, difficulties, whatever comes your way, we are to respond with a Christ-like attitude. And that's in the workplace as well, folks. I believe this is demonstrated best in the workplace. We should be standing firm and striving for the faith. Paul later writes in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, he says this, in your relationships with one another. Now, just think about this. Think about tomorrow. When you get up, who are you going to see? Who are some of the first people you're going to see? Now, if, if you're like most of us, you're going to get up and go to work in the morning. There's a lot of you, teachers and administrators, maybe you've got some time off, and that's great. But if you've got to get up and go to work in the morning, you're going to run into probably your boss, or your supervisor, your manager, your co-workers, all those people. So in your relationships, in all those relationships, Paul says, this is how you're supposed to be. In your relationships with another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He's talking about demonstrating humility and selflessness in relationships, even our work relationships. And he also encourages us in Ephesians 5.1 to be imitators of Christ as dearly beloved children. As a child, we want to imitate our father. 
our mother. We want to imitate our parents. As children, we love to imitate what we see. Little kids love it. You watch them and they'll imitate what they see and repeat what they hear. That's why you got to be careful what you say around little ones. We also are charged to imitate and model Christ's behavior and to be clear reflections of Jesus. Jesus maintained a perfect attitude in every situation. He prayed about everything and worried about nothing. I wish I was there. I really do. I'm not. Man, I wish I was there. But we too, we should seek God's guidance about every aspect of our lives. And we should allow him to work out his perfect will in our lives. You see, Jesus' attitude was never to become defensive. It was never to become discouraged. Yesterday, I had the occasion in which to let my attitude become sour or bitter. But I had a victory. I don't always have a victory over this, but yesterday I did. Let me share it with you real quick. First, my wife and I, we went shopping at Aldi yesterday. So, you know, you put your quarter in the cart, you unhook it, and you go through and you shop. We come through the line and we're checking out. And they take the cart we had and they swing it around and we get the other person's cart, you know, because they're loading the groceries in that. When you go back out, you undo your cart. You go to put your cart away. Well, this person had shoved their thing in, taken their quarter. I didn't have another quarter to get that thing hooked back up. So I could have had a sour attitude. I thought about going in and saying, hey, young lady, you know what you did here. Let's do it. Let's undo this. But they didn't. They did it. Then we were at another store. And we were walking through, and we were standing at the cash register. And we said something to the guy checking us out. And his answer is not, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What? That can sour your attitude. We're walking through the crosswalk, and a car goes by. And instead of stopping, they wave and keep on going. (laughs) All those things could sour your attitude if you let it. You can't let it. That's not what Jesus did. Things are going to happen, little things like that, and they can build up within 20 minutes. All those things can happen, and they can build up and give you a sour attitude. Don't allow those things to happen, because tomorrow when you go into work, some of those things might happen, or something similar to that. Just keep the attitude of Christ in all that you do. His goal was to please the Father rather than to achieve his own agenda or to get his own way. Our goal as we're going through life in this community In our culture, in in our workplaces, our goal should be to please the Father rather than to uh, achieve our own agenda. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven, Jesus said, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. In the midst of trials, he was patient. In the midst of suffering, he was hopeful. In the midst of blessing, he was humble. Even in the midst of ridicule, abuse and hostility Jesus according to our passage in 1 Peter 2 23 when they hurled their insults at him he did not retaliate when he suffered he made no threats instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly when Paul writes that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus he had summarized in the previous two verses what such an attitude was selflessness humility and service Listen to Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. In other words, the attitude a Christian should reflect is one that focuses on the needs and interests of others, even in the workplace. One night we decided to take our youth group out to eat. And it's, it's a place that's known to be pleasant and friendly. However, we were all just treated really rudely in this place. This person's attitude was as though we were an inconvenience while they were at work to serve. And that doesn't bode well for a restaurant. And I'm sure the bosses would have not appreciated that. We've got to check our attitude all the time. When Christ came into the world, he established a whole new attitude to relationships with others. 
One day when his disciples were arguing among themselves regarding who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said this in Matthew 20, 25 through 28. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, Jesus is teaching us that when we become preoccupied with our own things, it can cause conflicts and other problems with people we know. Instead, God wants us to have an attitude of serious, caring involvement in the concerns of other people. Paul speaks more about this uh, Christ-like attitude in his letter to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, he said, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So imitate Christ in your work. Imitate Christ in your attitude. And finally, let's imitate Christ in our mind. We must always keep in mind that God's ultimate goal for his children is not our comfort, it's our transformation. And more specifically, it's the transformation of our minds into an attitude of godliness. That's what he desires. He wants us to grow spiritually, to become like Christ. This doesn't mean losing your personality. It doesn't mean becoming a mindless clone. That's not what he's talking about. Christ-likeness is all about transforming our minds. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 12 too. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and, and, and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. One of the things that I least enjoy when I'm out is, as a customer is when I go into a place and I ask somebody, hey, how are you doing today? And the response is, well, I'll be doing better in two hours. Or 15 minutes when I get my break, what I hear is this. Maybe this is what you hear. I don't know. But what I hear is, it is such an inconvenience for me to be standing here the next two hours serving you, doing my job. That's what I hear. So if you have a job like that where you're working with people and they're like asking you how you're doing, just tell them you're blessed. It's a great day. I get to work. That's the attitude we should have. Not a, two hours, I'll get out of here. I personally don't want to hear it. I just want to walk out and leave my stuff there is what I want to do, but I'm not allowed to do that. I have to buy it and I keep going. Because I have a wife who puts me in check and I need that. But they have a mindset, like so many people today, that work is miserable no matter what you do. And that's sad. I remember uh, back in 1999, that was a long time ago for some of you. For some of you, that wasn't very long ago at all. But back in 1999, I remember I read a book called Fish. Anybody remember that? A few of you? If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. Yeah, it's outdated and it's old and all that stuff, but I would encourage you to read it, especially if you're a boss. John Christensen visited Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington. And he was amazed by the way the fish sellers were having fun during their work. They were having a blast. Now what you have to remember, we're in Seattle. Cold, rainy, kind of gloomy, gray skies, all that kind of stuff. And these fish sellers, and if you've ever been to a fish market, it's not the most aromatic place. I mean, it doesn't smell that great. It's early in the morning, usually, when they're out doing this. So a lot of strikes against it. But they're out there, and they're having a blast doing their work. And so to his surprise, they were laughing and shouting and tossing trout and salmon through the air just behind their customers' heads. They were also giving their customers a lot of attention. They were making sure that their customers' visit would be enjoyable, that it would be memorable, that they would want to come back. They couldn't wait to come back. Interesting thing about the fish seller's job was that it was exhausting. It's repetitive. And yet the sellers were able to find joy in their work and sell a whole lot of fish. 
And so John Christensen noticed that there were four core practices that everybody could implement in their work and their life. So maybe you don't have a job right now. Maybe you're retired, and that's great. But you can implement all this into your life. He called it the fish philosophy. And listen, you, no matter where you are in the workforce, you can implement these changes, okay? You don't have to be a boss. You don't have to be a manager. You don't have to be a supervisor. Number one, choose your attitude. That's good for all of life. You choose your attitude. A positive attitude is your choice. Just like a negative attitude is your choice. Listen, we can hate our job. We can dislike every hour we have spent there. Or we can accept it with all our responsibility and try and find joy in working there. As long as you can not control the external events, you can still control your attitude, the things that are going on inside. So instead of working and being grumpy, you can try to choose the positive attitude and find joy in your job. Next, be there. Be there. Now, this may sound silly. You know, I'm at work, so I'm there. That's not what I'm talking about. Be present. Be mentally present. Be physically present, but be mentally present. Be engaged with the people around you. Focus on the tasks that you're doing. Focus on the person you're trying to help. Don't fly away with your thoughts. If you're tired and grumpy, just don't. <laughs> just focus on the person. Try and help them to have a great experience. Number three, make their day. Make their day. Be the person that makes other people feel like they are your primary focus. Now this, this is great at work, but this is great in your home. It's hard. I'm not saying any of this stuff's easy. But help others feel like they are your primary focus. Kinlan was telling me about her sister Julie when she worked at the Elms. Julie was the type of person that everyone, she said, made them feel like they were the most important person in the world. And it made their day. So when you're meeting with people, when you're talking with people, just give them your undivided attention. I've told you guys about Jan Rutledge, one of the greatest listeners I've ever seen in my life. When she's talking to you, Mike, she's talking to you. She's not looking at Bev on the side or Heather on the side. She's looking at you. And if they start jumping around, she ignores them. She's looking at you and giving her undivided attention to you. That's the way we can be. And it makes you feel like a million bucks, like you're the only person in the room. So engage with them. Number four, <clears throat> play. Play. This practice might sound controversial, especially for bosses. But work can also be a source of fun. As long as you find the pleasure in coming to your work, you'll have more enthusiasm, more energy, and you'll be better to do your best. It's God's will that we imitate Christ in our work, in our attitude, and in our minds. So let's develop the kind of mindset described in the Beatitudes of Jesus. Let's develop an, an attitude that exhibits the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians. And let's emulate the principles of working as unto the Lord that Paul writes about in Colossians 3 as we learn to submit ourselves to others. And I believe you'll have more hope and your life will be fuller. Would you stand and pray with me this morning? Father, we come to you and we thank you, first of all, that there's nothing that goes on in our life that your word has not addressed in some way. And we thank you that even our work and our attitude and our minds are addressed as we serve you by serving others. So, Father, I pray that what we've talked about this morning, that we can apply it to our lives, that we can use it to help create a great atmosphere, whether it's at work or at home or even here in the church, that whatever we do, we do it all as we're doing it unto you. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Folks, this morning, we're going to have our staff and elders and people on our prayer team. They're going to uh, stand around the walls on the outside here. And uh, if there's anything at all 
that you would like to pray with them about. Maybe it's about just having a better attitude, a different mindset as you go to work tomorrow. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe you just need to have a better attitude with your family. Or maybe it's with your church. Maybe there's somebody here that, boy, you just don't know if you can worship here because of oh so-and-so. Maybe you need to get those things right. Any of those things. Anything at all. So I'm going to ask our elders and staff and people in our prayer team, if you guys will start making your way over there to those walls so people can identify who you are and they can meet with you and pray with you. And as we sing this song that Judy's going to lead us in this morning, uh, you're invited to go to one of them. But thank you. When I uh, start my Bible study at home, I usually start with prayer. And one particular morning, I ended that prayer saying, God, uh, help my righteousness be so good that it reflects you, you know, today. And then I turned from my prayer right into my Bible study. And the first scripture that I read was Matthew 6, 1. And it said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. And it went on to tell me why. And boy, it just took me back that I just asked God to help me with righteousness. And then he turned me to this scripture. 
And it was just amazing to me, you know, how things can work with God that way. But as I also thought more about the situation, I knew that God's word is our go-to book for how to, God's way, you know, the right way. So I thought of various things that uh, we use this go-to book for. And in our marriages, it's not just a submissive wife. It's uh, in his way, in his book, there's a way for the spouse on both spouses, the male and female spouse, to be in a marriage. And another uh, area I was thinking, and I was going to cover a few things, but Donnie, in his message, covered it very well of what can happen through your day to you as you go out about your day. And the right way, God has in there for our reactions. He tells us how to react to those things that upset Donnie, to the people that upset us. And also his word there, he chiseled in stone 10 right ways. And as we go into our communion time right now, there's a right way also for it. We don't just come here on Sunday at the end of the message, pass uh, our communion and have, and do our communion. God, Christ himself, established the right way, and it's recorded in our go-to book. We're supposed to meditate and remember him. And that's what I'd like you to do now in this communion. Let us pray. Father, just thank you that we do have the right way book available to all of us. And we thank you, Father, that your ways are listed in that for us to follow. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Offering time is also covered in God's uh, go-to book. And today there are mounted on the wall uh, our offering. At one time, they used to pass the tray, and then we'd place our offerings in the tray. And my husband John, when that tray would go by, he would give a big yoo-hoo! And I don't know how many of you might have heard that when we used to pass the tray. But I'm only saying now that God and I Love our cheerful giver. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can give back to you, Father, and we can give it cheerfully, Father. We just ask that you have a blessing on our offering time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand as we get ready to sing our last song? But first, I want to read Psalm 119, 9 through 10. And it says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity or on the path of rightness? It says, by living according to your word. It says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. So let's keep that psalm in mind as we sing this song.
for food. 